here with us this afternoon um, for this next Clifton conversation. This is number four. Let me see. We started with Paul Ryan. We went on to Ashley Frost. We had a very tricky time with Tanya Stubbles and some very challenging technology a couple of weeks ago. And I'm delighted that we are here this week with John Bockor. So John, welcome. Thank you very much for doing this this afternoon. Um, given that these conversations are all very much about celebrating local talent and local artists, I'm just wondering whether you'd like to start by telling us where you live. I live in Bulleye, um, up sort of up the hill from the highway. Um, I've been here for 13 years and uh, before that we were in Marrickville in Sydney. So it was a, it was a big change. And you bought the house because you spotted that there was a space there where you could have a studio at home, which is what every artist wants. And now to find studio space for artists locally has become as rare as hen's teeth. It was very hard in Sydney to find studio space. And I think that is what happens with most big cities as, as things become less affordable, uh, the arts just leave. You know, because yeah, which of course has been the Northern Illawarra's gain. I mean, there's an incredible yeah. density of um, artists here. And I just wonder, do you feel that you're part of that community or are you a sort of fairly isolated person who prefers not to be a joiner? I'm not an incredibly social person, um, but that being said, there are many painters that I know in the area and we visit each other's studios from time to time. And, you know, I'm always happy to talk to them. And, um, and it's nice to have other people around who are doing similar things to you mm. and you can sort of bounce ideas off because sometimes, you know, you can be creating uh, in a void, so to speak, you know, you, you're creating on your own and you become, uh, sort of caught up in, in one particular part of your practice and um, it's great when you have someone with fresh eyes who hasn't seen the work and you might show them 10 things and they'll say something completely unexpected that'll make you think about it for ages when once mm. they've left and you think oh wow am I really doing that I had no <laughs> idea I didn't one of the reasons that I particularly wanted to talk to you, John, is because so far we've talked to artists who've been very much inspired by the local landscape in the case of yeah. Paul and Ash in particular. And your work is so different because your work is so much about um, interiors and about still lives. And, um, and I find them so joyous and so kind of sensual. And I'm, I'm interested in, um, the fact that there's a kind of European quality to your work. Now, your name, Bokor, you're Hungarian originally, is that right? My dad was from Hungary and he he came out here with his family in 1956. You didn't come you didn't come from an from an unartistic family because your father was an architect and is still a practicing architect. And I think there was a lot of there were a lot of sheets of paper at home where you as a child could get to draw so that is that where it all begins yeah that's where it all begins that and my um my godmother who lived two doors up um we used to communicate a lot when i was a small child by drawing each other pictures and putting it into the letterbox in my house my parents you know my father being an architect it was all sort of clear surfaces whereas her place was piles of books, piles of paper, pet hair on every surface. Um, it was heaven as a child. So yeah. um, my dad, of course, being an architect, he had pens, he had pencils, mm. he had, you know, the, the large sheets of paper that you got in between um, copying paper and you could draw on that. So, yeah, I was always drawing as a kid. I wasn't... Um, I wasn't super social as a child either. I mean, I, you know, reasonably so, but I really liked time alone to draw. 
really enjoyed it. It's interesting because uh, I'm thinking about the precision of architecture and then, you know, I mean, I know obviously you went through your training at the National Art School, but, you know, you've got a very loose kind of style, which is the antithesis of the kind of precision that architecture yeah. requires. And going back to what I said about your name and this kind of sense I get from your interiors of a sort of European sensibility, I know that seeing the work of Bonnard when you were an art student, when you first went to Europe, that was incredibly important to you. The other artists that um, I'm thinking of when I look at your exuberant colour are Matisse and Dufy. Oh, yeah, 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 absolutely. And Marquet as well. I love Albert Marquet's work. Just beautiful. I went to art school when I was quite young. I was 17 when I first went in there. And... I didn't know anyone outside of uh, outside of the high school art syllabus, you know. So it was wonderful because the National Art School at the time was part of TAFE. All the teachers that taught us were practicing artists. So I had um, uh, I had Wendy Sharp for a teacher. I had Elizabeth Cummings. I'm just looking at this beautiful interior that we, we've got up at the moment with the um, pink walls. And I'm just wondering, mm. where do these rooms come from? Are they from friends' houses? Are they from books? In 2015, 2016, I was painting interiors in friends' houses and in my house. And I was really enjoying it. But... I hit a wall with it a few times where because I knew all these spaces because they're all houses and rooms that I'd been in, I wouldn't make any changes. You know, if a bookcase was there, well, then the bookcase was there. And if the couch was a certain distance to the coffee table, I would make sure that that distance was in there. So the physicality of the space was confining in a funny right. way. Uh, and I wanted to break out of that, making it sort of part imaginary space. I found those kind of interior images of, you know, from like interiors magazines mm. that were online. And I started to do kind of drawings and little paintings from, from those. And it was quite freeing because I had no idea of the space. Plus a lot of the elements in the space, I didn't personally like. Um, although I liked the overall composition. You weren't invested. It wasn't a friend's place, so you didn't feel that exactly. you owed them that sort of fidelity where yeah. they might say, but the couch isn't green at my place. Why did you do that? So you suddenly exactly. could do whatever you liked. I could play around with it. And I was doing things like, you know, I'd take, I'd take a whole wall and I'd make it full of paintings instead of bookshelves and, and a door or something. And, and when, when I'd approach these paintings, I'd think to myself, oh, what could they be? And so <laughs> this exciting thing, and I was like, oh, I'll make this one, you know, uh, like a French pastoral landscape, and then I'll make this one a, ch a child's drawing, and I'll make this one a geometric abstract painting. And I could play around with the rugs, I could play around with the furniture. Um, um, can you see the picture that we've got up at the moment with the blue yeah, couch? Yeah, I can. What is <laughs> it about making pink so dominant in your interiors that appeals to you so much? I don't know. It's very kind of human or something. I, I'm, just, I'm just drawn to it. Um, I, I try to resist it. You know, like <laughs> lately I've been doing paintings that have almost no pink in them because um, I, I'm trying to... Um, work my way through a few other colour combinations. You're trying to get through your pink period. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, so, yeah, I don't know what started it off. I guess you don't... Look, whenever I paint from, from a few years ago, I kind of... I've had this thing in my head that whatever it is that you want to do, you should do it without thinking. Because when you sit back and you look at the painting and you carefully consider things, you always make the logical choice. And the logical choice comes from that part of your brain that wants to make everything uh, make sense and make everything mm. 
into a, 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 a sort of relatable pattern that you know and that you understand. Whereas the part of your brain that kind of jumps on impulse is the part of your brain that makes things that surprise you or make things that are a little bit kind of more or a little bit better than what you actually would have done with your conscious mind. Because I so, think that you're, you're striving for a kind of spontaneity there. And I was really interested in an interview that I was listening to um, with you yesterday where you talked about your mother doing shorthand and about this very oh, yeah. quick script and how you think of yourself as being quite an impatient person and that, you know, you mm. draw quite fast and you paint quite fast. And this came up again with Paul Ryan. You know, he likes to paint a picture in a day. He likes that yeah, very yeah. focused kind of energy and drive, but then he likes to kind of, you know, move on so yeah. is that what you're trying to access is is a kind of spontaneity and an impulsiveness is that the energy in your work yeah definitely definitely i want i want life i want spontaneity um and i, I love abbreviated forms when i look at fast drawings that people do um i love the marks and again you know what i was attracted to in my mother's shorthand um it was the shapes of the marks. Mm -hmm. It was quite beautiful because it was a language that I don't understand. And it's the same with, with other, other languages that are, you know, different to our script. Um, you can see the beauty in it because you can't understand what the words are, you know. So the shapes were quite beautiful. And, you know, sometimes you've just got to let your hand make a shape, even if it's kind of not quite right for whatever you're trying to describe because the shape in itself is beautiful. But also you can suggest something um, with just a couple of strokes. You don't have to fill out the whole thing mm. for us to identify a piece of toast or um, some sausages and scrambled egg. In fact, you paint quite a lot of table surfaces. You're quite interested in vessels, in mm. vases, in, in things that contain liquid or you know hold food but i also get the impression that you're quite interested in the food itself and and i seem oh, yeah. to remember that you told me a lovely story when we were talking the other day about the recipes that you collected from your grandfather uh, my grandmother yeah my, grandmother. Uh, when my grandparents came out from hungary um <clears throat> my grandfather was very good at playing bridge and he didn't have a lot of other skills here so he um he had a bridge club in Double Bay and my grandmother used to cook for everyone there. And so she'd cook for 30 people or something. Wow. And she was really, really a good cook and all Hungarian food. And so when we were, when we were children, um, my sister and I, I've got an older sister, uh, we used to stay at her place um, every Saturday night, I think it was. And, um, and then at the end of, of, of when we were being picked up on Sunday, she'd say to us, what do you want to eat next week? We knew her whole repertoire, you know? And, um, and so we'd say, oh, we want cauliflower soup. We want to eat, uh, you know, schnitzel. We want mashed potato. We want this, you know? And it had to be three courses. She'd make, she'd make a soup, a main meal, and a dessert for us. I wonder, John, whether those tables that you paint are a kind of expression of a nostalgia for the way your grandmother would have set the table. Do you mm. think that subconsciously you are kind of recreating something from your childhood or am I way off track? I often think that when a painting's finished, um, it's when it looks like something to you. So instead of it being all these marks in paint, it suddenly looks like, you know, a Sunday afternoon in the 1960s <laughs> in, you know, the countryside in France or something. And you don't know why. It just looks like that. And you think, aha, uh -huh, that must be done then because it's, it's giving something back in a funny way, you know, uh, whereas you might have been going for something that was completely different to what it looks like in the end, but you have to stop it when it starts 
sort of giving you all sorts yeah. of information. Messages. Your work is it's very collectible. It's sought after. You've got a great gallery in Sydney. You exhibit with the King Street Gallery. Um, you know, you've, you've um, won prizes. You're in major collections. Do you feel that this is a kind of vindication for all that time when still life and, um, and these sorts of paintings of, of real life were, um, you know, when you were at art school, abstraction was all the go. And now, oh, yeah. you know, look at it. Everybody is dying for these pictures of things that they recognise and things that are part mm. of everyday life. Things go in and out of fashion. Mm. Uh, and sometimes you can see it when it's happening and sometimes, sometimes you can't. And however many years something is in fashion or out of fashion, you know, who knows and who knows why it happens um i'm just glad that at the moment uh people don't absolutely hate my work so that's good <laughs> i think one of the things that's funny about your work that i really like is you know there's all this sort of richness of color and texture and they're, they're very sort of sensual works to me and then you give them these absolutely cut and dry almost banal titles like you've got one i love the one that's called sink with panadol that was a terribly sad time oh. see it's children's panadol and my son uh he had pneumonia and they just took so long to diagnose him um and he was just getting sicker and sicker and the, that panadol was always on the bathroom sink and um, uh, yeah, I, I remember, I was glad someone bought it because I kind of didn't want it around. It's one of those terrible memories that you're just like, yeah, yeah, I don't, <laughs> I don't need to see that painting anymore. For the last show that I had at uh, the Nicholas Thompson Gallery in Melbourne, you notice that all the titles are Somerset Warm Short Stories. <laughs> I'm a big believer that we're not just able to do one thing. We've sort of got two or more uh, kind of ways of of, um, of expressing inside you. And it's often a fight. It's a fight sort of with me on the canvas that part of me wants to be the architect's son and make <laughs> everything quite... Uh, quite ordered and neat and to be absolutely the way it should be and then there's part of me that wants something anarchic in there that just sort of um, comes out of nowhere you know they, they take a long time generally um, they're painted o over the top of paintings over and over again most of them um, it rarely happens in one go uh, I would love to paint paintings in one go, but they never, they never satisfy me. So I keep, I keep sort of going and scraping them back, painting on top of them, scraping them back, painting on top of them. Um, and so they end up a sort of accumulation of various states of mind, various uh, days of frustration and days where it, all works out well so yeah it's a it's not conscious i guess but it's you know it's part part of your consciousness and really interesting to see how that frustration translates into what looks to me like a such an expression of joy so you know yeah. i think that that is a very fruitful tension mm. that you're talking about there i like being in this place so uh, I, I feel like it's, it's easier to be a painter here than uh, many other places I could if I lived somewhere else in the world. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess where you live, I think, kind of informs your work uh, in how it makes you feel. The one thing I'm kind of learning is that you've got to pace yourself. You can't do everything at once. And if you end up painting interiors for three or four years and you've got something else that you want to work on as well, you can work on that later. It's not, you know, it's not a race. And um, uh, 
yeah, that's something that I didn't feel like that when I was younger, but I'm starting to feel like that. Now. Yes, I think that's a very, that's a very mature realization. It's not a race. Thank you all and take care, stay well, stay safe and see you soon. Bye bye. Thank you.